हरि ओम ओम हरि ओम ओम हरि ओम ओम सहनावतु सहनो भुनक्तु सह वीर्यं करवावहै तेजस्विनावदितमस्तु मविद्विषवहै ओम शांति 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 Om, may the divine being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the divine being support and nourish us as a mother and father. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. Om peace, peace, peace be unto thee, unto us, and to all your beloved children everywhere. Well, good evening everyone and welcome to our Tuesday evening reading and discussion of the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. Our beloved Haima is our reader and uh, before she begins, is there any other question? Bhagavan Das brought up one. Uh, is there any other question, concern, or uh, comment that you would like to make about this that we're reading or uh, anything else in the nature of spiritual practice? All right, Haima, dear, please. Uh, let's go right ahead. Dear Brother Shankara, good evening and namaste, everybody. We are on page 63 on PDF, and I'm sure the book is slightly different. You know the calculation. I'm going to start it one day soon after. That's where I will be beginning. We are still, the author is still talking about Narendra. That's where we are right now. One day soon after, Narendra requested Sri Ramakrishna to pray to the Divine Mother to remove his poverty. Sri Ramakrishna bade him pray to her himself, for she would certainly listen to his prayer. Narendra entered the shrine of Kali. As he stood before the image of the Mother, he beheld her as a living goddess ready to give wisdom and liberation. Unable to ask her for petty worldly things, he prayed only for knowledge and renunciation, love and liberation. The master rebuked him for his failure to ask the Divine Mother to remove his poverty and send him back to the temple. But Narendra, standing in her presence, again forgot the purpose of his coming. Thrice he went to the temple at the bidding of the master, and thrice he returned, having forgotten in her presence why he had come. He was wondering about it when it suddenly flashed in his mind that this was all the work of Sri Ramakrishna. So now he asked the master himself to remove his poverty and was assured that his family would not lack simple food and clothing. And this proved to be the case for the rest of their lives. They had many other difficulties, yeah. uh, particularly uh, uh, relatives trying to take their ancestral home and so on. So there were many lawsuits and so on that Narendra, later Swami Vivekananda had to deal with, but uh, they did not lack for plain food and clothing. They, uh, they were not prosperous, but they were not poor either. All right, dear, please read on. This was a very rich and significant experience for Narendra. 
it taught him that Shakti, the divine power, cannot be ignored in the world and that in the relative plane, the need of worshipping a personal God is imperative. Would you repeat that? It's sure. so important to us as yes. spiritual aspirants. Yes. This business about a personal God. Mm -hmm. That was a very rich and significant experience for Narendra. It taught him that Shakti, the divine power, cannot be ignored in the world and that in the relative plane, the need of worshipping a personal God is imperative. God or goddess, in the, this case, of course, it's Shakti, the divine uh, feminine. But uh, it, 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 whatever it is that is your leaning or what you're given as instruction by your guru, that's what you should follow. We should follow either the leanings of your heart, God or Goddess, or if you're given instruction as to Ishta Devata, your chosen ideal by your teacher, your guru, you follow that instruction. Any comments, concerns, or questions? All right, dear, please read on. Sri Ramakrishna was overjoyed with the conversion. The next day, sitting almost on Narendra's lap, he said to a devotee, pointing first to himself, then to Narendra, I see I am this and again that. Really, I feel no difference. A stick floating in the Ganges seems to divide the water, but in reality, the water is one. Do you see my point? Well, whatever is, is the mother, isn't that so? In later years, Narendra would say, Sri Ramakrishna was the only person who, from the time he met me, believed in me uniformly throughout. Even my mother and brothers did not. It was his unwavering trust and love for me that bound me to him forever. He alone knew how to love. Worldly people only make a show of love for selfish ends. That's the, that's about Narendra. Any questions, comments, Brother Shankara? Any comments? Nothing from me except to yes. underline this idea that we must have a relationship with the, the divine as a as a manifest being as a personal God. This is what uh, Narendra or Swami Vivekananda says elsewhere, particularly in Christ the Messenger. He tells us why it is so very important for us to have this relationship with the divine being made manifest because it is the only thing that the human mind can relate to. The heart can relate to something much more vast but uh, th that is to say that which manifests the divine person the, the personal god but uh, the uh, the mind needs this and if you want to understand what i'm talking about read that little volume christ the messenger mm -hmm. which is the transcription of a talk that he gave in pasadena california in January of 1900. Mm -hmm. So uh, please, if you want to know why Narendra and Swami Vivekananda believes this relationship with personal God is uh, as manifest as the avatars, the incarnations, mm -hmm. is so important, you'll find it there. So, uh, Brother, Brother Shankara, this is Jeff. I have a question. Yes, Jeff. Um, uh, Sri Ramakrishna um, worshipped Kali as his Ishta, and uh, we on this path are instructed to um, uh, consider Sri Ramakrishna to be our Ishta. Um, is there anything, any message that we should see in that, or am I... Uh, um, 
worried about nothing because I'm just putting a stick in the water when really it's all one. So, well, I think you've answered your own question. Yes, in a sense, you're just putting a stick in the water. As Sri Ramakrishna pointed out, there was no difference between him and Narendra, and certainly he saw no difference between himself at the end of his life. Uh, he was very vocal about the fact that uh, pointing to his body, he said, there are two here, the mother, by that he meant Kali, and her worshiper, by that he meant Vishnu, the one who had come, as he said in other contexts, he who was Rama, he was Krishna, is present here as Ramakrishna. Well, who, who was Rama, who was Krishna? They were Vishnu. They were incarnations or, or avatars of Vishnu. So there was absolutely no, it was all the one, the, the one consciousness. But it appears to us, just as it appears to us that there are nine people here this evening, just as that appears to us, so it appears to us that there is the divine being uh, impersonal, the divine being personal, and then as Sri Ramakrishna says, there's something even beyond the personal and impersonal. Uh, uh, that from which it all arises. And so this is only known to us. It only becomes known to us in the sense of capital K knowing through our spiritual practice. As we deepen our practice, we begin to sense, oh yes, there is one, only one. And uh, that is I am that, I am not the body, mind, uh, intellect complex, uh, though I appear to be, and uh, I participate in the phenomenal world in that role, that's, that is transitory in the, the extreme, that is to say, it will be sustainable for uh, 80 years or so, uh, and then it'll pass away. So why be attached to it in any way? Does that answer your question, Jim? Uh, yes, thank you. So how does how do you deal with this from a, a Yanni perspective? Well, why does that concern you? Basically, because I'm trying to understand how you go from Brahman to Shakti. Did, did, did your, did your uh, guru instruct you to be a jnani? No. Then please uh, don't spend too much time considering these things. The jnani point of view is a totally alien point of view to the one that you are pursuing as a bhakta. You are giving your, your instructions, as I understand the instructions given by the Ramakrishna order swamis, they tell us, as Sri Ramakrishna said, the proper frame of reference, the proper way of pursuing uh, our spiritual practice is as a bhakta. So don't concern yourself over much about being uh, about the thinking jnani thoughts a jnani a true jnani almost always is a monastic because they do not have anything whatsoever to do with the world they simply renounce everything having to do even with relationships they are most often hermits. So it's best not to concern ourselves over much about uh, what it is 
that occupies the mind of a jnani. Uh, it's a totally different frame of reference. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I, there's actually a basis for why I was asking that, something that Swami recently said, and that, you know, he said that you have to go through the the nitty 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 stage before you can pass to the 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 vigyani and that the the vigyani where you re realize the world as being a real manifestation of shakti really seems like a lot easier stance to take but you know neti neti does not mean becoming a gyani it simply means uh, I understand that I am not this, I am not that. I am not the body, I am not the mind, I am not the intellect, I am not the things of the senses. This is neti neti. It doesn't mean becoming a jnani. And vijnana is the last word. The becoming a vijnani is the last word in spiritual practice. And so, uh, yes, the Swamis will speak of it. Sri Ramakrishna speaks of it. But it is, uh, for most of us, that's a long way down the road. First, we have to become a good bhakta. And, and learn to appreciate the divine presence uh, in all of its glory. Then at, at some point, we see that glory as a Vijnani sees it. I hope that makes sense. Uh, Brother Shankara, this yes. is Jeff, Jeff again. Um, I too have Vijnani thoughts and um, I, I suppose I'm primarily a bhakta, but I also have karma yoga thoughts. And I thought that those of us on this path have the freedom to uh, pursue whatever yoga uh, is best suited for us. They all ultimately lead to the same place. I well, of course you have that freedom. Of course you have that freedom. But your guru gave you instructions uh, and uh, it's best you will make the most rapid progress if you follow the instructions you are given. And there's no reason for you to limit yourself to that. But because we have a lot of time on our hands, generally speaking. Uh, but uh, when I say follow the instructions given to you, I mean, why ask a teacher for instructions if you're not going to follow them? That's the only pledge that you make, that you will do your best to follow those instructions. So by all means, uh, all of the others are there. Karma Yoga is very, very closely allied with Bhakti. Um, and that's what uh, the, the Bhagavad Gita is essentially all about, is how to practice Karma Yoga. Anything else from anyone before we go on? Thank you, Jeff, as always. Thank you, sir. Okay, really, please read on, Jeff. Okay, Brother Shankara. Now we are moving on to other disciple named Taraknath Goshal, shortcut is Tarak. Others destined to be monastic disciples of Sri Ramakrishna came to Dakshineshwar. Taraknath Goshal had felt from his boyhood the noble desire to realize God. Keshap and the Brahma Samaj had attracted him but proved inadequate. In 1882, he first met the master at Ramachandra's house and was astonished to hear him talk about Samadhi a subject which always fascinated his mind. And that evening, 
he actually saw a manifestation of that superconscious state in the master. Tarak became a frequent visitor at Dakshineshwar and received the master's grace in abundance. The young boy often felt ecstatic fervor in meditation. He also wept profusely while meditating on God. Sri Ramakrishna said to him, God favors those who can weep for him. Tears shed, shed for God wash away the sins of former births, births. And that's the end about end of Tarak. Mm -hmm. We are moving on to Baburam, another disciple. Baburam Ghosh came to Dakshineshwar, accompanied by Rako, his classmate. The master, as was often his custom, examined the boy's physiognomy and was satisfied about his latent spirituality. At the age of eight, Baburam had thought of leading a life of renunciation in the company of a monk in a hut shut out from the public view by a thick wall of trees. The very sight of the Panchavati awakened in his heart that dream of boyhood. For those of you who don't know, the Panchavati was a grove of five trees that Sri Ramakrishna himself planted at Dakshineshwar uh, in order to be to provide a screen uh, for his spiritual practices. He would retire inside the Panchavati and fight inside this screen of five trees. He could not be seen. And so this is why this, uh, this Panchavati awakened these feelings in Babaram. Okay, dear, go ahead. Babaram was tender in body and soul. The master used to say that he was pure to his very bones. One day, Hazra, in his usual mischievous fashion, advised Baburam and some of the other young boys to ask, ask Sri Ramakrishna for some spiritual powers and not waste their life in mere gaiety and merriment. The master, scenting mischief, called Baburam to his side and said, What can you ask of me? Isn't everything that I have already yours? Yes, everything I have earned in the shape of realizations is for the sake of you all. So get rid of the idea of begging, mm -hmm. which, which alienates by creating a distance. Rather realize your kinship with me and gain the key to all the treasures. Now there is the instruction to us all particularly those who have taken instruction. The master is anxious. He, he, he created his spiritual treasure box in order to share it with us. So, uh, like he says, you don't have to beg. You don't have to ask. You just have to be near me. You just have to be in relationship with me. And it, it is all yours for the taking. Now, this promise is so vast as to be incomprehensible to the mind. It's only comprehensible to the heart. Uh, and you come to this comprehension through spiritual practice and descending within until your heart is attuned to what is meant by what Sri Ramakrishna says here. Because his heart and your heart are not separate. This is what he meant when he pointed to Narendra and said, I see no difference. Your heart and the Master's heart are one heart, one capital C consciousness. Any comments or questions or concerns? Okay, dear, please read on. 
That was about Baburam. Now we are moving to another disciple called Niranjan. Nitya Niranjan Sen was a disciple of heroic type. He came to the master when he was 18 years old. He was a medium for a group of spiritualists. During his first visit, the master said to him, My boy, if you think always of ghosts, you will become a ghost. And, you, and if you think of God, you will become God. Now, which do you prefer? Niranjan severed all connections with the spiritualists. During his second visit, the master embraced him and said warmly, Niranjan, my boy, the days are flitting away. When will you realize God? This life will be in vain if you do not realize him. When will you devote your mind wholly to God? Niranjan was surprised to see the master's great anxiety for his spiritual welfare. He was a young man endowed with unusual spiritual parts. He felt disdain for worldly pleasures and was totally guileless like a child. But he had a violent temper. One day, as he was coming in a country boat to Dachineshwar, some of his fellow passengers began to speak ill of the master. Finding his protest futile, Niranjan began to rock the boat, threatening to sink it in midstream. That silenced the offenders. When he reported the incident to the master, when he reported the incident to the master, he was rebuked for his inability to curb his anger. That's the end of Niranjan. Mm -hmm. Next is Jogindra. Jogindra Nath, on the other hand, was gentle to a fault. One day, under circumstances, very like those that had evoked Niranjan's anger, he curbed his temper and held his peace instead of threatening Sri Ramakrishna's abusers. The master, learning of his conduct, scolded him roundly. Thus to you each, the fault of the other was recommended as a virtue. The guru was striving to develop, in the first instance, composure, and in the second, metal. The secret of his training was to build up by a tactful recognition of the requirements of each given case the character of the devotee. Now, uh, once again, mm -hmm. notice that uh, the master gives careful attention to what will build up the spiritual character of the devotee. If you are in a relationship with the master, this is exactly what will happen to you. This is exactly the reason to be in relationship with the master. If you take instruction from Ramakrishna or Swami, well and good, but you don't have to. As the master says, the treasure box is there for the taking. So, uh, of course, it's auspicious to take that instruction because it will accelerate your progress as we understand these things. Uh, it, it has the potential to accelerate your progress. Any comments or concerns or questions? All right, dear, please read on. Jokindranath came of an aristocratic Brahmin family of Dakshineshwar. His father and relatives shared the popular mistrust of Sri Ramakrishna's sanity. At a very early age, the boy developed religious tendencies spending two or three hours daily in meditation and his meeting with Sri Ramakrishna deepened his desire for the realization of God. He had a perfect horror of marriage, but at the earnest request of his mother, he had had to yield and he now believed that his spiritual future was doomed. So he kept himself away from the master. Sri Ramakrishna employed a ruse to bring Jogindra to him. 
As soon as the disciple entered the room, the master rushed forward to meet the young man. Catching hold of the disciple's hand, he said, What if you have married? Haven't I too married? What is there to be afraid of in that? Touching his own chest, he said, If this is, meaning himself, if this is propitious, then even a hundred thousand marriages cannot injure you. If you desire to lead a householder's life, then bring your wife here one day and I shall see that she becomes a real companion in your spiritual progress. But if you want to lead a monastic life, then I shall eat up your attachment to the world. Jogin, Jogin was dumbfounded at these words. He received new strength and his spirit of renunciation was re-established. That was the end of Jogindranath. Now we are moving on to Sashi and Sharat. Shashi and Sharat were two cousins who came from a pious Brahmin family of Calcutta. At an early age, they had joined the Brahmo Samaj and had come under the influence of Keshab Sen. A master said to them at their first meeting, if bricks and tiles are burnt after the trademark, trademark has been stamped on them, they retain the mark forever. Similarly, man should be stamped with God before entering the world. Then he will not become attached to worldliness. Fully aware of the future course of their life, he asked them not to marry. The master asked Shashi whether he believed in God with form or in God without form. Sashi replied that he was not even sure about the existence of God. So he could not speak one way or the other. This frank answer was very much pleased the master. Sarath's soul longed for the all-embracing realization of the Godhead. When the master inquired, whether there was any particular form of God he wished to see, the boy replied that he would like to see God in all the living beings of the world. But the master demurred. That is the last word in realization. This is Vigyana. Yes. This, this, this it was just requested by Sharat is, is Vigyana. And master, the master says, this is the last word in spiritual life. One cannot have it at the very outset. Sharath stated calmly, I won't be satisfied with anything short of that. I shall trudge on along the path till I attain that blessed state. Sri Ramakrishna was very much pleased. Mm -hmm. That is the end of Shashi and Sarath. Now we are moving on to Harinag, another disciple. Just let's just to take, to take sure. a moment with Shashi and Sharat. Mm -hmm. Two such different people. Very much. Such different beings. And yet they both became part of the masters inner circle. When Shashi came to the conclusions that he came to later on, uh, his allegiance to the master was uh, unparalleled. Okay. Your next disciple is Harinad. Harinad had led the austere life of a brahmachari, even from his early boyhood, bathing in the Ganges every day, cooking his own meals, waking before sunrise, and reciting the Gita from memory before leaving bed. He found in the master the embodiment of the Vedanta scriptures. 
aspiring to be a follower of the ascetic Shankara, he cherished a great hatred for women. One day he said to the master that he could not allow even small girls to come near him. The master scolded him and said, you are talking like a fool. Why should you hate women? They are the manifestations of the Divine Mother. Regard them as your own mother and you will never feel their evil influence. The more you hate them, the more you will fall into their snares. Hari said later that these words completely changed his attitude toward women. The master knew Hari's passion for Vedanta, but he did not wish any of his disciples to become a dry ascetic or a mere bookworm. So he asked Hari to practice Vedanta in life by giving up the unreal and following the real. But it's not so easy, Sri Ramakrishna said, to realize the illusion, illusoriness of the world. Study alone does not help one very much. The grace of God is required. Mere personal effort is futile. A man is a tiny creature after all, with very limited powers. But he can achieve the impossible if he prays to God for his grace. Thereupon the master sang a song in praise of grace. Now, uh, repeat that about the uh, achieving the impossible. Yes, I will. The master knew Hari's passion for Vedanta, but he, he, but he did not wish any of his disciples to become a dry ascetic or a mere bookworm. So he asked Hari to practice Vedanta in life by giving up the unreal and following the real. But it's not so easy, Sri Ramakrishna said, to realize the illusioniz illusioniness of the world. Study alone does not help one very much. The grace of God is required. Mere personal effort is futile. A man is a tiny creature after all with very limited powers. But he can achieve the impossible if he prays to God for his grace. There it is. All of us can follow this instruction. What seems to us impossible as we uh, look with a, a sometimes daunted feeling at our spiritual practice. What what is the what is our resource? Pray to God for His or Her grace. And uh, but we have to remember to do that, and uh, that's not always easy in the moment. Any comments or questions? All right, dear, please read on. Whereupon the master sang a song in praise of grace. Hari was profoundly moved and shed tears. Later in life, Hari achieved a wonderful synthesis of the ideals of the personal God and the impersonal truth. That's the end of the Hari, Harinath. Now we are moving on to Gangadhar. Read that last line again. Sure. About what he achieved. Okay. Later in life, Hari achieved a wonderful synthesis of the ideals of the personal God and the impersonal truth. There, there it is, uh, Bhagavan Das. Keep at it, and you will, uh, you will uh, achieve this same synthesis by the grace and it won't be a matter of self-effort it will be a matter of grace i mean you, you you your mind will of course continue to occupy itself with whatever it occupies itself with but this synthesis will become yours 
This is the promise. The promise was just made. Anything else from anyone? All right, dear, please read on. Next disciple is Gangadhar. Gangadhar, Harunath's friend, also led the life of a strict brahmachari, eating vegetarian food cooked by his own hands and devoting himself to the study of the scriptures. He met the master in 1884 and soon became a member of his inner circle. The master praised his ascetic habit and attributed it to the spiritual disciplines of his past life. Gangadhar became a close companion of, companion of Narendra. And the next disciple is Hari Prasanna. Hari Prasanna, a college student, visited the master in the company of his friends Shashi and Sarath. Sri Ramakrishna showed him great favor by initiating him into spiritual life. As the, the master did not initiate very many people. He, he uh, those people that he uh, initiated were those that he could see would just roar forward, uh, given the uh, given his initiation. Now, when we are initiated by a Ramakrishna order, Swami, this is the same. Uh, the the result will be the same but for most of us this roaring forward won't be the case uh it would just be too much for our nervous system um but uh, we will make much more rapid progress than we would otherwise any comments or questions from anyone about any of that All right, dear, please read on. Sri Ramakrishna showed him great favor by initiating him into spiritual life. As long as he lived, Hari Prasanna remembered and observed the following drastic advice of the master. Here it is. Even if a woman is pure as gold and rolls on the ground for love of God, it is dangerous for a monk ever to look at her. That's the end of Hari Prasanna. And Hari Prasanna lived as a monk. He didn't take formal vows, but he lived as a monk. Next is Kali. Kali Prasad visited the master toward the end of 1883. Given to the practice of meditation and the study of the scriptures, Kali, Kali was particularly interested in yoga. Feeling the need of a guru in spiritual life, he came to the master and was accepted as a disciple. The young boy possessed a rational mind and often felt skeptical about the personal God. The master said to him, your doubts will soon disappear. Others too have passed through such a state of mind. Look at Narain. He now weeps at the names of Radha and Krishna. Hmm. Kali began to see visions of gods and goddesses. Very soon these disappeared and in meditation he experienced vastness, infinity and the other attributes of the impersonal Brahman. That's about Kali. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to talk about Subodh, another disciple. Subodh visited the master in 1885. At the very first meeting, Sri Ramakrishna said to him, you will succeed, mother says so. Those whom she sends here will certainly attain spirituality. During the second meeting, the master wrote something on Subodh's tongue, stroked his body for the navel to the throat, and said, awake mother, awake. He asked the boy to meditate. At once, Subodh's latent spirituality was awakened. He felt a current 
rushing along the spinal column to the brain. Joy filled his soul. That's about Subodh. So, just, just know in all these things that happened to these individuals that were in Sri Ramakrishna's lifetime, all these things can happen to us as well. Whether they will or not depends on our karma, depends on our relationship with the Master and on what he deems and what Holy Mother deems is necessary for us. But don't think that these things are things that happened only to those that were in the Master's presence. We are in the Master's presence. The Master is with us this very moment. Okay, please read on, dear. Starada and Tulasi. Two more young men. Sarada Prasanna and Tulasi complete the small band of the Master's disciples, later to embrace the life of the wandering monk. With the exception of the elder Gopal, all of them were in their teens or slightly over. They came from middle-class Bengali families, and most of them were students in school or college. Their parents and relatives, relatives had envisaged for them bright worldly careers. Envisaged. 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 Okay. Envisaged. It means it means foreseen. Yeah. Their parents and relatives had envisaged for their for them bright worldly careers. They came to Sri Ramakrishna with pure bodies, vigorous minds, and, and, and uncontaminated souls. All were born with unusual spiritual attributes. Sri Ramakrishna accepted them, even at first sight, as his children, relatives, friends, and companions. His magic touch unfolded them. And later, each according to his measure, reflected the life of the master, becoming a torchbearer of his message across land and sea. That's about Sarada and Tulasi. Mm -hmm. Now we are going towards women devotees. With his women devotees, Sri Ramakrishna established a very sweet relationship. He himself embodied the tender traits of a woman who had dwelt on the highest plane of truth, where there is not even the slightest trace, trace of sex. And his innate purity evoked only the noblest emotion in men and women alike. His woman devotees often said, we seldom looked on Sri Ramakrishna as a member of the male sex. We regarded him as one of us. We never felt any constraint before him. He was our best confidant. They loved him as their child, their friend, and their teacher. In spiritual discipline, he advised them to renounce lust and greed and especially warned them not to fall into the snares of men. That's so about this is, we often hear about Rome with Sri Ramakrishna uh, warning men about women and gold. He war warned these women about men and gold. Lust and greed are just a way of translating the Bengali uh, of woman and gold or man and gold in this case. Mm -hmm. So there's identical teachings to these, uh, to the, uh, to each gender about uh, what it is that must be renounced if you're going to make the most rapid spiritual progress. Is all that clear, everyone? Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, let's go on. Next, we're going to talk about Gopalma. Unsurpassed among the women devotees of the master in the richness of her devotion 
and spiritual experiences was Aghoramani Devi, an orthodox Brahmin woman. Widowed at an early age, she had dedicated herself completely to spiritual pursuits. Gopala, the baby Krishna, was her ideal deity, whom she worshipped following the Vatsalya attitude of the Vaishnava religion, regarding him as her own child. Through him, she satisfied her unassuaged maternal love, cooking for him, feeding him, bathing him, and putting him to bed. This sweet intimacy with Gopala won her the sobriquet, sobriquet of Gopala. It, it, it means a, a special name. Sobriquet is a special name. Sobriquet, okay. This sweet intimacy with Gopala won her the sobriquet of Gopalma or Gopala's mother. For 40 years, she had lived on the bank of the Ganges in a small bare room, her only companions being a threadbare copy of the Ramayana and a bag containing her rosary. At the age of 60 in 1884, she visited Sri Ramakrishna at Dakshineshwar. During the second visit, as soon as the master saw her, he said, Oh, you have come. Give me something to eat. With great hesitation, she gave him some ordinary sweets that she had purchased for him on the way. The master ate them with relish and asked her to bring him simple curries or sweets prepared by her own hands. Gopalma thought him a queer kind of monk, for instead of talking of God, he always asked for food. <laughs> she did not want to visit him again, but an irresistible attraction brought her back to the temple garden. She carried with her some simple curries that she had cooked herself. One early morning at three o'clock, about a year later, Gopalma was about to finish her daily devotions when she was startled to find Sri Ramakrishna sitting on her left with his right hand clenched like the hand of the image of Gopala. She was amazed and caught hold of the hand whereupon the figure vanished and in its place appeared the real Gopala, her ideal deity. Wow. She cried aloud with joy. Gopala begged her for butter. Mm -hmm. she, she pleaded her poverty and gave him some dry coconut candies. Gopala sat on her lap, snatched away her rosary, jumped on her shoulders and moved all about the room. As soon as the day broke, she hastened to, she hastened to Dakshineshwar like an insane woman, of course. Gopala accompanied her, resting his head on her shoulder. She clearly saw his tiny, ruddy feet hanging over her breast. She entered Sri Ramakrishna's room. The master had fallen into Samadhi. Like a child, he sat on her lap and she began to feed him with butter, cream, and other delicacies. After some time, he regained consciousness and returned to his bed. But the mind of Gopala's mother was still roaming in another plane. She was steeped in bliss. She saw Gopala frequently entering the master's body and again coming out of it. When she returned to her hut, still in a dazed condition, Gopala accompanied her. She spent about two months in uninterrupted communion with God, the baby Gopala never leaving her for a moment. Then the intensity of her vision was lessened. Had it not been, her body would have perished. The master spoke highly of her. Now let's let's just pause there a moment. Sure. Uh, the, the, this is something for us to take into account. 
when we yearn for the highest, uh, understand that our bodies, our nervous system, may not be able to take that uh, level of, uh, uh, it's uh, like standing in the, the brilliant sun uh, for hours on end. No, that's, uh, we can't do that. So this is why uh, in the prayers it said, Oh, how do stream down in moonlight? Because it is the, only in the reflection of this brilliance that we can endure uh, the, the presence of the divine a, a, until, until we're ready to uh, shed the body, in which case uh, this is what will happen to us. We, uh, we find our way Oh, well, we won't go down that path this evening. Anything else from anyone before we begin to wind it up? It's getting close to the hour. You know, I, I'd never heard of Gopala until we uh, started reading the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, but I don't know what it is about it, but the stories about Gopala just fascinate me. They're, they're very captivating. Well, it's... it's uh... It, it, the baby, the baby go, the baby Krishna, Gopala. You know, is uh, I mean his his adventures, his Rasa Lila in Vrindavan. Uh, you know, he was brought there as a, as just a baby to rescue him from someone who wanted to kill him. So. Uh, that he came to uh, to Vrindavan to become one of the coward boys, and uh, the the stories of the baby Gopala and then the uh, the young the young boy Krishna in that Rasa Leela, uh, just absolutely, it was one of the things that just entranced Sri Ramakrishna's heart. He loved the stories of the of the Rasalila, the the adventures at Vrindavan. So yes, Gopala is, appeals to our heart naturally. Thanks for bringing that up. Anything else from anyone? A uh, question on this topic. Yes. Up at the top of the first paragraph about Gopalma, um, it says um, she worshipped following the Vatsalya attitude of the Vaishnava religion. So, does Vatsalya mean um, uh, a relationship to Lady Gopala as if you are the mother? Is that what Vats Vatsalya means? Yes, uh, in, in short. There's there's more to it, but uh, you know the 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 uh, Vaishnava path is a, is a very elaborate one, and has to do with uh, Krishna coming to uh, Bengal as uh, uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and uh, taking that form. And uh, then uh, uh, establishing these relationships with uh, with the divine presence as Krishna. This was what uh, what uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did, and one of the relationships is this Vatsalya. Um, you can look it up, look up the term Vatsalya. There's a great deal there. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else from anyone? All right, tears. We'll leave it there for this. Okay, evening. we'll start from there next week. Om Hari Om. Om Hari Om.
ओम हरिओम मे द डिवाइन बींग लुक ओवर अस लविंग मे एस अ मदर एंड अ फादर यस इंडीड मे द डिवाइन बींग सपोर्ट एंड नर्श अस एस अ मदर एंड अ फादर मे वी हैव द स्ट्रेंथ एंड स्किल to study together as we have the art of spirituality how glorious so any final thoughts from anyone all right we will call it quits for this evening of course there's tomorrow evening's class and then as we go on there's uh the saturday uh I, I, is there a saturday class i don't think so because the swami so we yeah. swami jnana yoga nanda will be here so i don't think there's a saturday class or a sunday talk from here i think that'll all be a uh, jnana yoga nanda for his uh, retreat this weekend so just look to the newsletter or to the website and it will tell you everything you need to know so a great good night to you all thank you brother shankara good night everyone good night until tomorrow evening jai 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 shri ram krishna jai